Warning, the following podcast might be too truthful for most liberals. Listener discretion is therefore advised. Welcome to the Tea Party Power Hour. My name is Mark Galar. I'll be your host today as we interview Peter Schweitzer, the author of a brand new book called Blood Money, Why the Powerful Turn a Blind Eye While China Kills Americans. Peter, welcome back to the show. Oh, it's great to be with you. Thanks so much for having me. You have written a a series of very important books on China, and that doesn't even count the movie Ride the Dragon, which is available through the, the Government Accountability Institute. When you say blood money, you're not exaggerating. This this is serious. There are Americans losing their lives because of the efforts of China. So isn't it something like every year we lose the same number of people we lost in Vietnam due to their efforts through fentanyl and other things? Yeah, I mean, this book is different in some of the other books I've written because there is actually a very large, uh, sadly, uh, body count of Americans that have died. So we're losing about 100,000 Americans a year to fentanyl poisoning. A lot of the people that are dying of fentanyl poisoning don't even know they're taking fentanyl. They think they're taking a Vicodin or an Adderall or something like that. So this actually has major consequences. It is now the leading cause of death for people under the age of 45 in the United States. And as I lay out in the book, a lot of people think this is being done by the Mexican drug cartels. Mm-hmm. They're actually the junior partners. This is a Chinese operation that is designed to undermine the United States and kill Americans. I'll plead guilty to that I am one of those people that if you had asked me before I read your book about fentanyl, I'd have said, yeah, you know, that, that's why we can't have open borders. The, the country of Mexico is killing us with fentanyl. And I may have heard a little bit in the past about some of the precursor materials coming from China, but I really was holding Mexico to blame. And I think anytime you talk about fentanyl, that's what most Americans do. But when you say that the Chinese are involved in this fentanyl, it's from A to Z. I mean, they, they're making the precursor materials. They're sending it to Mexico. They're giving Mexico machines to press pills. They're, I mean, they're involved in the financing, everything. I mean, from start to yeah. finish, it's a Chinese, based on what I read in your book, it's a Chinese operation. Yeah, yeah. Every every link in the chain is, is really China's involvement. Um, you know, Chinese organized crime connected with the cartels in around 2012 and introduced them to this notion of fentanyl. Up until that point, of course, the cartels, the Sinaloa cartel and the others, it was all about cocaine and heroin and those drugs. Fentanyl gives them 10 to 20 times greater profit margins than those drugs did. So they're able to make a lot more money at the same time, uh, China accomplishes its goal, which is to weaken the United States. And so you're quite right. The precursors, the port that the precursors arrived to in Mexico, that's run by a Chinese company. There are 2,000 Chinese nationals at the, on the border, United States-Mexican border, that are helping the cartels create the fentanyl. The pill presses come from China. The cartels, when they operate in the United States, they use communication devices that are encrypted in China because they know the Chinese will not share those communications with U.S. law enforcement, and even the money laundering. I mean, it used to be in the old days that the cartels, when they were selling cocaine, would launder their money in Latin American banks. They now use Chinese state-owned banks, and they sometimes use Chinese students in the United States on education visas to actually do the money laundering for them. Wow. Now, a quote that you have in the book from Sun Tzu from The Art of War It says, the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. And the fentanyl, from what you said in the book, is part of a multi-pronged approach to subduing the United States without having to fire a shot. Yes, it's, uh, they call it disintegration warfare. Uh, It's based on a book written in 2010, very, very popular among Chinese military officers. And what disintegration warfare basically says is what you just quoted from Sun Tzu. It's an updated version of that. And the idea is that the best strategist is the one who beats their enemies without actually fighting them. And there are all kinds of sort of deceptive stratagems that are included in that. One of them is murder with a borrowed knife. And that's what I think is going on with fentanyl. In other words, you're actually committing the murder, but it seems like it's coming from somewhere else. China's behind fentanyl, but it's actually Mexico that's getting the blame. Mm -hmm. Another one is 
watch the fire burn from across the river. In other words, help fan the flames of a fire, but, you know, plead that you're innocent. We're on the other side of the river. We're on the other side of the world. We're not involved in some of the social turmoil in your country. So it's a strategy of disintegrating and fragmenting the United States. And I would argue they're, they've been very effective at doing so. I, you said about 100,000 people per year. Yeah, if you can get those types of casualties without firing a shot, it is a successful operation. Now, another way they're coming after us is by teaching street gangs how to turn their, their semis fully auto, these sear switches for Glocks. Tell us a little bit about that and the Chinese involvement in that. Yeah, um, beginning in 2018, China started smuggling into the United States these auto sear switches, or sometimes they're called Glock switches. These are illegal in the United States unless you get a very special federal permit. And of course, if you're a felon or a member of a criminal gang, you're, you're not allowed to own them at all. Mm-hmm. Well, the Chinese particularly marketed these towards criminal gangs and felons. And what it does is you slip this small device into a Glock handgun, and it turns a Glock handgun into a fully automatic machine gun. And you can go on YouTube and you'll find lots of examples of police officers coming under a hail of bullets of machine gun fire from gang members who are actually using these devices. They sold these openly on Alibaba, which is their uh, app equivalent to Amazon. They advertise them in English and they have come in by the thousands into the United States. And it's one of the reasons we have this massive increase in machine gun fire in the United States today. So basically, street fighting, street gang fighting now sounds like an actual war zone because they're using military-type weapons. Now, one of the things, and I'm going to jump back to fentanyl for a minute, one of the things you pointed out is that everybody talks tough on fentanyl, but no one wants to hold the... Chinese accountable. They'll just, they kind of focus on the demand side, not the supply side. Why are so many U.S. politicians looking the other way on where the fentanyl is really coming from? I think it's a combination of things. I think, uh, generally speaking, there's a lot of people in Washington, D.C., in elective office that are kind of go along to get along. They don't Mm -hmm. want to make tough choices. Right. They want to make easy choices. And look, if you accept the reality of what China is doing to us. You cannot have a normal relationship with this country right now. And that means making difficult choices. And some of them would rather sort of look the other way. The more narrow problem is you do have some leaders in powerful positions. I would put Joe Biden in this category. I would put Mitch McConnell in this category that have financial entanglements with China, with Chinese entities that mean if you raise this issue, it could cause serious damage to your economic fortunes, it could be deeply embarrassing politically. So they're making the calculation that they're going to look the other way, even though China is engaging in this behavior. This is a good time to take a break. We will be right back with Peter Schweitzer to discuss his brand new book, Blood Bunny, right after these messages. Now, everybody has heard that TikTok is kind of a spy app. It's gathering information on Americans. But when you take a look at how the Chinese have infiltrated social media with TikTok, their infiltration of video games, even movies, theater-level movies, there's a bigger prize out there. I mean, they want to control the minds of young people. Yeah, and they're they're explicit about it. It's not just us theorizing. I actually quote extensively from Chinese military officers, from members of the Chinese Ministry of Propaganda, that that's exactly what they intend to do and are in fact doing now. And that TikTok is, in the words of one military official, I quote, the Trojan horse that allows them to accomplish that in the United States. They're very subtle about this. When people think of propaganda, they think of something very crude and overt. Actually, they're very sophisticated sophisticated in what they're doing uh, online and TikTok, and it is working and it's effective. The additional problem you have is that a lot of Hollywood studios have signed financing agreements with Chinese companies that give these studios capital investment. But at the same time, these companies get a say in what's in the script. And I give lots of examples in the book of 
everything from Kung Fu Panda 3 to uh, major action uh, adventure movies that are influenced by this Chinese money. Yeah, they're kind of towing the party line. Yes. Everything, you know, there, there's so much we don't think of. It's sort of like when you look at the United States and you see how the left has taken over the courts, taken over entertainment, taken over the news media, taken over academia. When you look at that, you're kind of like, wow, you know, how did, how did they slip up and do all that? How, what were we doing when they were taking over these various institutions, having this long, slow march through the institutions? And you almost kind of feel the same way with China. I, I mean, you look at just how embedded they are, and you have to ask yourself, well, what were we doing when all this was taking place? And it just, I just feel like they're so much smarter than us. And what are, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, how, did we just have we just been looking the other way for a long time? Well, I think a lot of us have been looking the other way, and other people have been effectively paid for looking the other way. I mean, look, there's a lot of money that has been made by certain individuals and institutions in China, whether it's Wall Street, Silicon Valley, and Hollywood. And that money has, has really encouraged people to look the other way or make excuses for what's exactly going on. The good news is I think the American people are waking up. This is becoming a central issue of importance. You even see uh, uh, some people on the Democratic side, Senator Warner from Virginia has been very aggressive on the issue of TikTok and what the Chinese are using it for. So I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm a realist about what lies ahead. We can't be pessimistic because if you're pessimistic, you just end up doing nothing. And I think our country is worth fighting for. So we need to be realistic about what we face and aggressive in trying to protect our interests. One of the things that shocked me in the book is you were pointing out how TikTok is training our young people to look for short bursts of dopamine and that it's now, because they're used to these quick hits on TikTok, they have trouble sitting through a one-hour class, for example, in a university, or they, they can't focus on things for long periods of time because they're being trained by TikTok to get that short-term reward. Tell me a little bit about that. How is TikTok helping to dumb down America or our children? Yeah, they call it cognitive warfare. That's the term that the Chinese use. And they view that the competition with the United States is really about who's going to have the greatest intellectual and technological capabilities going forward. And so we have TikTok in this country, which is heavily focused on kind of silly videos, short videos with attention spans, a limited attention spans. In China, they have their own version of TikTok. They don't call it TikTok. They call it Dayun. And Dayun does not emphasize silly videos. It emphasizes educational videos and things about art and culture and history. So you're actually learning something. This is intentional. I mean, they're feeding our kids cotton candy and they're feeding their own kids spinach through ByteDance, this company. And it is part of this cognitive warfare strategy. It's lessening attention spans, abilities to concentrate among young people. It's leading to certain physical problems. They call it TikTok ticks, which leads to a certain repetitive behavior among heavy users of it. You can't use the equivalent heavily in China because they limit the amount of time you can use it every day. They don't limit it in the United States, and that is by intention and design. It's part of this cognitive warfare strategy, as they call it. Another thing they do with their, their influence over social media is that they do try to sow chaos, kind of like the Russians back in the 2016 election. You didn't really see them coming out for one candidate or another. They were trying to fan the flames of both sides. And you see them doing that here in America with various issues. It's not about picking one side over the other. It's about getting a bunch of people mad at each other, at each other and hoping that they'll go out in the streets and fight with each other. You mentioned a group, I believe it was called PSL. You also talked about the FRSO and how these groups will go out and bust people into protests. And they'll take what would be a genuine protest over a genuine subject and then fan the flames until it's not a peaceful protest anymore. It's a riot. So, I yeah. mean, tell me a little bit about that. Who are these groups that are infiltrating Antifa and BLM and trying to make things more violent than they already are? Yeah, the Freedom Road Socialist Organization, FRSO, has cells around the country, and they are pro-CCP. They are uh, specifically beholden to the P uh, CCP, 
Their leaders have met with each other. The CCP tracks their activities. The FRSO wants to carry the Chinese party line. The same thing with the Party for Socialism and Liberation, PSL. These groups were really at the forefront of a lot of the violent protests, the disruptive protests in the 2020 during BLM and the the, uh, 2020 election. They are now the same groups that are leading a lot of the pro-Hamas violent protests in the United States that are occurring today. This is part of the Chinese strategy. I quote military officers saying that this social chaos and division is sapping America of its strength. This is a good thing. So again, this is part of the Sun Tzu strategy. You turn American against American, you exaggerate the conflicts, you force people to pick sides, and by doing so, you are going to undermine their ability to effectively govern and compete uh, with China. Last subject we have, to, we have to cover, and that is the pandemic. I thought you made a brilliant point in the book in that whether the virus was intentionally released from a Wuhan lab or whether or not it accidentally leaked out. The real story was how China reacted, the way they covered it up, the way they bought all the PPE materials up while the rest of the world was in ignorance about what was actually going on. So whether it was intentionally released, not intentionally released, it was an accident, their reaction to it and the way they took advantage of it to damage the United States in order to be able to say, look, people in our communist country are living, people in the capitalist country are dying. I mean, they even made a propaganda piece out of the pandemic, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. No, they they had an explicit strategy to maximize America's body count. Once they knew that there was a virus they were dealing with, they worked to maximize the body count so that more Americans would die, and they wanted to use it as a tool to show the superiority of China over that of the United States. And they were successful in several cases like California and New Jersey in kind of imposing the CCP's model for virus control in a way that was totally alien to the the manners of the past. I mean, I quote in, in Blood Money extensively from what our traditional approach was, when you have an illness like this, the sick people need to stay home and everybody else needs to go about their normal lives. So you minimize anxiety, you minimize dis- disruption. Mm-hmm. The Chinese approach was you lock down everyone and everything. And we ended up imitating that, particularly in California and New York and New Jersey. And that was a huge propaganda victory for the CCP. It didn't really work. It wasn't really effective, but they cajoled and manipulated us into imitating them. And that, that is part of what people have to understand. China did not view this as a health crisis where we work together. They view this as a crisis that they could use to their advantage. And unfortunately, people like Tony Fauci and other senior officials kind of played along with this. I think that's very true. Fauci really was all over the place. It's not going to affect us. It is going to affect us. Wear a mask. Don't wear a mask. Wear two masks. I mean, (laughs) yeah, I think uh, I think it was a CNN reporter who asked him if he was just making this up as he went along. And it might be one of the first times I ever saw something I liked on CNN. So now let's talk about the fact that the Bidens are heavily involved with China. Now, you have a great movie available at the Government Accountability Institute. It's called Riding the Dragon. Is that still available for free for people to watch? Yes, you should be able to find it on YouTube. And it was done in 2020, and it highlights a lot of the commercial ties, the money ties between the Bidens and China. What I show in Blood Money is I sort of take it a step further because it turns out, I didn't know this, of course, earlier when we were reporting on this, it turns out that there is actually just one degree of separation between the Biden family and the fentanyl trade. You know, we talked about China's involvement in every link in the chain of the fentanyl trade. Well, one of the critical gangs, criminal gangs that did that was a gang called UBG, which is headed by Zhang Anlo, who goes by the name White Wolf. They made the Sinaloa cartel the kings of fentanyl. Well, White Wolf, this criminal gang leader, had a business partner who in 2017 wired $5 million to the Biden family. So the question is, why does Joe Biden not want to talk about fentanyl? 
I think the more accurate question is why would he want to talk about the fentanyl crisis? Because there's one degree of separation. It would be deeply embarrassing. It would blow back on him. And I think it's one of the ways in which these financial entanglements involving the Bidens have really, really limited his ability to confront the threat that we face from China. And I saw something come out yesterday, or maybe it was the day before. Apparently, Patrick Ho wants his $1 million retainer back. <laughs> yes, it's, it's quite interesting how they, the Bidens collected a lot of money from a lot of foreign nationals in Ukraine and Russia and China, and there's no discernible evidence that anything was done to benefit, that there was no discernible business, uh, legitimate business activity that went along with that activity. And the question's always been, what do they do to receive that money? I think that a lot of it has to do with access and influence and favorable decisions carried out by Joe Biden. But obviously, some people like Patrick Ho feel like they didn't get their money's worth. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm sure he didn't. <laughs> so it, it, I just think that I just thought that was hilarious. I was reading the book and then I received an email about Patrick Ho wanting his million bucks back. First of all, this book's already number one on Amazon. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. And I guess we can assume that in addition to Amazon, it's available wherever good books are sold. Absolutely. You can find it at uh, Costco, Target, Walmart. Barnes and Noble, and of course, Amazon, you can find it anywhere. Appreciates people's interest, and you can go to peterschweitzer.com. We'd love to get people's feedback, what they find interesting in the book, what they'd like us to research in the future. I uh, have a great research team, and we're constantly looking for new projects. Oh, well, fantastic. And I got to say, the one thing that really shocked me was that FDR's grandfather was in the opium trade. <laughs> that no surprised idea. me too yeah yeah that I, surprised I, me I too no idea. well look i know you're busy you're, you've got interviews scheduled all day long thank you for the time you've given us love to have you back sometime and until then i'll just say good luck and i hope this book uh you know outsells harry potter <laughs> well thanks so much for having me i enjoyed it absolutely thank you peter bye-bye bye you've been listening to the tea party power hour with mark gillard 